Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me this afternoon, and thank you to Nawa for having me. My name is Lauren Vaccaro, and I am an art and fashion historian based in New York City. My presentation today is focused on the research I did for my master's thesis. The title of my paper was Uncanny Accessories, Fashion and Surrealism, and this is what I will be discussing today. Before we begin, I wanted to briefly introduce myself. I was born and raised in Las Vegas, Nevada. When I was younger, I always had a strong interest in fashion and devoured fashion magazines and bookstores. I would like to think that this was a precursor to my love for research now. However, growing up in a city like Las Vegas, which does not have major art, any major art museums, discovering anything having to do with the arts was solely dependent on my love and desire to learn on more on my own. When I first came to visit New York in January of 2014, my first museum visit was to the Museum of Modern Art. The experience of going to major institutions like MoMA and the Metropolitan Museum of Art on this visit solidified my desire to pursue a career in the arts. At this time, I was working towards my bachelor's degree in communication studies, and my advisor suggested that I focus my extra credits needed to complete my degree um, into a specific area so I could graduate with a double major. I did just that and have my BA in both art history and communication studies from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. This past summer, I completed my master's degree in art history and archaeology from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. My primary focus at the IFA was modern and contemporary art, but they also required us to take classes in other areas as well. However, regardless of the course topic, I was always interested in researching the female artists of the given period the class was focused on. A few of the past internships I've held while completing my MA were at David Zwerner, MoMA, and The Met. While I was at David Zwerner, I had the opportunity to research on Annie Albers, Alice Neal, and Joan Mitchell. Last spring, while I was writing my thesis, I was interning at both MoMA, specifically the painting and sculpture department, and the Costume Institute at the Met. The research I was assisting with at each of these institutions coincided with my thesis topic. As I was initially investigating what I wanted my thesis to focus on, I knew I wanted to write about fashion as a form of art. Surprising with, surprisingly, within the canon of art history, fashion is not necessarily recognized as an art form from what I have witnessed in my research as a scholar. It seems that neither art nor fashion want to embrace one another. And I personally feel that art history has not embraced fashion as an art form, despite the countless commissions from artisans to work with fellow visual artists and major fashion houses collaborating with artist estates and contemporary artists. Much of what I've encountered in my art history background focusing on feminism has been the emphasis of undress as opposed to dress. The innumerable examples of male artists depicting women in the nude dominates many of these conversations, but I think the way gender is signified through clothing is a topic that needs to be canonized in art history. When I went to Paris in the summer of 2019 during, during my trip, I went to the iconic cabaret Crazy Horse Paris while I was there doing research for my thesis, I kept thinking about the sensual nature of accessories and how they change the perception of the body. Sometimes I think it's best to take myself out of art and see how these ideas are situated in another form of art, such as performance. All of that is to say, I chose to focus on surrealism and the fashion pieces created during this movement because there has been quite a lot of literature on this subject to assist my research and strengthen my argument. I also made sure to focus on accessories and garments that featured bodily imagery because I wanted to investigate how the surrealists use fashion to transform the ordinary state of the body to bring out the fantastic beauty waiting in the altered or adorned fashion body complex. The two artists I chose to focus on were Merit Oppenheim and Elsa Schiaparelli. Both of these artists were working towards establishing their respective careers in Paris during the 1930s. I was fascinated by their works because I saw that they interpreted Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytical findings concerning the fetish and uncanny in their fashion designs. They were the few women who were docu they were excuse me, they were a few women documented during the 
creating fashion objects during this time. Additionally, they collaborated on pieces together. Schiaparelli became aware of Oppenheim's fashion designs through one of her friends. Once Schiaparelli saw Oppenheim's work, she promptly commissioned a piece of jewelry from the artist. Oppenheim constructed a fur-covered brass bracelet for the Italian fashion designer. The inspiration for the bracelet occurred during winter, and fur, fur soon became Oppenheim's preferred material to incorporate into her designs. She created two bracelets comprised of two pieces of light brown fur and a hollow brass tube. It is unclear how close Schiaparelli and Oppenheim's relationship was or how many they, pieces they collaborated on. However, the commission of a fur-covered bracelet changed the course of surrealism and the history of modern art forever. This bizarre accessory launched the creation of Oppenheim's masterpiece titled Object. In every account of Object's inception, its life cycle started with a bespoke Schiaparelli bracelet. As the story goes, Oppenheim was out to lunch with Dora Maar and Picasso at the Café Flor in Paris. The conversation turned towards the eye-catching item circling Oppenheim's wrist. Drawn to the unique construction of the accessory, Picasso remarked that nearly anything could be covered in fur. Oppenheim famously stated that the cup and saucer sitting on the table in front of them could easily be adorned with fur. And soon afterward, the sculpture shook the audiences, shook audiences and the surrealists. Both Oppenheim and Schiaparelli used accessories to synthesize the outer shell that women present to society with unsettling expectations imposed upon them. These women designed bizarre fashions that did not rely on the gendered presumptions enforced by societal standards. Both artists employed garments and accessories to transform the body into an attainable fantasy from the perspective of the new woman, which was a term coined after World War I to women who dressed in unconventional styles, painted her face with cosmetics, and constructed an unabashedly garish caricature that highlighted the construction of femininity. The ostentatious presentation of self in combination with a sexual assertiveness that was previously only acceptable for men um, generated an unforeseen gender fluidity with women taking on masculine traits while maintaining a hyper feminine appearance. Carolyn Evans noted that male power was confronted with this unfamiliar form of gender fluidity brought about by the newfound independence of women. The expression of this modern lifestyle allowed women to customize their self-presentation through clothing, performing more gender fluid identities and their own fantasies. Sigmund Freud was a critical influence on the surrealists such as Man Ray who produced these images. Freud's work was challenging to access for many of the Paris based artists as translations of his work into French did not become available until 1922. Surrealist artists began to delve into the unconscious for inspiration. They looked to Freud for insight into formulating the unrealized visions and obsessions lingering within their unconscious minds. The themes in Freud's essays, Fetishism of 1927 and The Uncanny of 1919, emanate powerfully in, in surrealist work when the human body is the focus. The body's sexual interpretation permeates the imagery depicted in their works, especially the organs that bring life into the world. In fetishism, Freud theorizes that the fear of castration haunts young boys who have witnessed their mother's lack of a penis as they presume they may face this violent act in the future. Freud argues that this information is difficult to comprehend since the belief that a penis still exists remains in their minds despite the proof that it is untrue. The reward for fighting um, against the fear of castration is a repressed and complicated relationship to female genitalia. In The Uncanny, he describes the underlying sensation of repressed fear housed in the unconscious. He writes, our conclusion could then be stated thus, an uncanny experience occurs when repressed infantile complexes have been revived by some impression or when the primitive beliefs we have surmounted seem once more to be confirmed. According to Freud, what is uncanny is frightening because it is not known and unfamiliar, not known and familiar rather. 
Naturally, not everything which is new is unfamiliar and frightening. However, the relation cannot be inverted. The uncanny surfaces strangely familiar memories, bringing them to light. A semblance of rational judgment is necessary to define the uncanny, to rationalize the likelihood of these imagined scenarios coming to fruition. The connection the individual has to these objects or memories generate the veiled anxieties that inhabit the unconscious. While I was researching Oppenheim and Schiaparelli, I felt that these photographs by Man Ray illustrated these fears perfectly as they exposed the female body through the male gaze, revealing their castrated bodies to the world. In The Uncanny, Freud references a belief by Ernst Jentz that a particularly favorable condition for awakening uncanny sensations is created when there is intellectual uncertainty whether an object is alive or not, and when an inanimate object becomes too much like an animate one. During childhood, the distinction between animate and inanimate object is blurred as objects resembling humans, like dolls, are nurtured as if they were alive. Although fear may not be aroused initially in these items, such as these, the softened distinction between the animate and inanimate creates confusion on how to perceive similar objects in reality. If an item has features, there is a possibility of, rather, if the item has human features, there's a possibility that it is alive. Another concept that forms the sensation of the uncanny is the double. This is defined as the multiplication of what is known, particularly relating to the body, in order to preserve the object in question from obsolescence. The double also mirrors the repressed sphere of death. Freud specifies that the manifestation of death is often figured by dismembered limbs, a severed head, a hand cut off at the wrist, feet which stands by themselves, all of these having something particularly uncanny about them, especially when, as in the last instance, they prove to move of themselves in addition. As we know, this kind of uncanniness springs from its association with the castration complex. Oppenheim and Schiaparelli materialized this concept in their designs by doubling body parts um, by doubling the body, body parts their fashions were meant to adorn. The mirrored appendages create a sense of uncertainty regarding the life and death of both the animate body and inanimate object. The fear of death as an uncanny sensation is fully actualized as human body parts appear lifeless while simultaneously activating the animate objects they wear. Oppenheim's manifestation of the uncanny in her fashion designs causes anxiety insofar as her investigation of the unconscious renders, the visible, renders visible the body's interior structures. In the illustration for Sketch for Gloves with Veins from 1942 to 5, the top of the glove is marked with veins, as if the skin protecting these vital branches had just melted away. The veins branch out among the phalanges like trees, struggling to deliver blood to the comatose hands. The majority of Oppenheim's fashion designs were never produced. However, this illustration came to fruition in the fourth volume of German art magazine Parquet. For this collaboration, a numbered edition of 150 gloves was included in the deluxe issue of the publication. Beyond the creation of accessories, Oppenheim used jewelry to illustrate the significant imprint fashion transfers onto the body. As all humans have the same foundation, gender performance contributes to the spectrum of self-expression that is hands through clothing and accessories. Oppenheim's X-ray strips away her external shell to reveal her bones and the jewelry that, is, that has fused with her inner foundation. The ossified outlines of her facial features, neck and right hand decorated with baubles, reveal the importance of these objects to her structural core. Two round hoops hover in space as to mark the location of her ear, while a delicate silhouette of a beaded necklace that circles her neck, while a delicate silhouette of a beaded circlace circles her neck, rather. Oppenheim's faint hand is observable by the thick rectangular rings on her ring and pinky fingers. 
The contrast between the visceral tactility of her bones and joints and the faint shadow of her nose and lips that fades into the background accentuates the liminal space between existence and disappearance. Schiaparelli's exploration of the uncanny fear of death in her creations goes beyond the hand. The skeleton dress presented in her 1938 haute couture collection titled Le Cirque, meaning the circus, was born out of a collaboration with Salvador Dali. The inspiration was a, clear, clear, was a near direct translation of a sketch of a woman with her arms outstretched sideways and her skeletal infrastructure exposed under a shield veil of fabric. The morbid essence of this dress stood out amongst the rest of the pieces in an otherwise lighthearted collection filled with candy hued garments fastened with whimsical buttons shaped like circus performers. The inclusion of this piece within this theme may have been influenced by a specific circus performance titled The Skeleton Man, constructed out of silk crepe, silk crepe, trapunto quilting, and cotton wadding, Schiaparelli sculpted her interpretation of a rib cage onto the gown and stitched around the protrusions to highlight them. An offense against good taste and sleek lines of the popular evening wear of this era, the skeleton dress would fit the body like a second skin and her imagined corpse rose to the surface of the body. Jennifer Sweeney Risco notes that this dress is a pivotal object that illustrates Gabrielli's desire to use the female body as a blank slate with which to construct a version of a mask to strengthen and externalize the nuanced gender disparities faced by the new woman. The skeleton dress functions to withdraw the appearance of life from the body as a visual metaphor for the submerged fear of death that waits beneath the skin. Although the bracelet that Oppenheim created for Schiaparelli was the first piece they collaborated on, their aesthetics overlap in other accessories they produced in the late 1930s. After their initial partnership, Oppenheim and Schiaparelli continued to work together on undisclosed projects. There are astonishing resemblances between illustrations Oppenheim produced and objects Schiaparelli fabricated. One of the most striking similarities appears in the belt designs by each artist. They both designed belts that depicted a pair of hands encircling the wearer's waist. Oppenheim's version was never created but the surviving sketch depicts a white band with two flesh colored hands with red fingernails overlapping one another to form the clasp. To bind the hands together and to ensure the belt's closure, Oppenheim used either a small piece of rope or a bracelet appearing as a thick chain around the wrists. Schiaparelli's version has an arrestingly similar composition, which raises the question of whether Oppenheim was aware of Schiaparelli's designs prior to working with her. Evening belt comprises a black silk band with two clasped white plastic hands functioning as the buckle. It was common in many of Schiaparelli's designs to include whimsical decorations made from plaster or plastic. In her fall 1934 collection, Schiaparelli incorporated the hand motif in a handbag with closures echoing the shape of the bag, as well as in garments, including a jacket and cape. Like the red veins coursing through the gloves in Oppenheim's pair of gloves, the red nail polish decorating the fingertips of both of these sets of hands emphasize their uncanny resemblance to the human appendage they mirror. The belts also take on the fears of castration develop, developed in the unconscious mind of men and cast upon women. The hands appear delicate, yet grasp the waist of the, the individual they encompass. The belts recall the hands of a lover enveloping the waist of their beloved in a protective and affectionate embrace, while the proximity to the groin implies a far less romantic fantasy. The hands take on a sinister presence as they call to mind the looming fear of castration. The hands are positioned downward, ready to make their way to geld the female phallus. The conflict represented in both of these belts oscillates between affection and horror. The fixation on the hand through the production of gloves by both oops, sorry, the fixation on the hand through the production of gloves by both Oppenheim and Schiaparelli evolved as they elevated its form with materials that exude eroticism. 
Schiaparelli's winter collection of 1936 to 37 was one of the many she and Salvador Dali co-produced, incorporating his imagination into her visu visualization of the body. Schiaparelli designed a pair of black suede gloves that include small red snakeskin ovals placed on the position of nails. Another pair of evening gloves designed in 1936 are bedecked with gilded metal nails resembling claws against sumptuous calf velvet. The eye-catching nails contrast with the shadow-like hands that appear to have crept out of a nightmare onto reality. Oppenheim also used decorative nails in her version of an eroticized glove. Mammalian by design and in line with her fascination with fur, fur gloves with wooden fingers imagine hands covered in light brown fur with wooden extensions placed at the tip of each finger. She painted the elongated appendages to resemble skin with red fingernails. If worn, these gloves would be unnaturally long, veering towards the grotesque rather than the sensual. Freud's discussion of the boy's anticipa anticipation while searching for the female phallus is manifested in the footwear designs by Oppenheim and Schiaparelli. The materials with which they crafted their extraordinary shoes evoke pubic hair and entertain the fetishist's fascination with the possibility of a female phallus. As Freud articulates in his essay, the foot lures the eyes up to travel the in, up to travel towards the inner thighs to discover the absence of the appendage. The pubic hair that cloaks the genital region provides the last hope for the young boy's quest for genital assurance. Oppenheim applied this motif to the feet in an illustration of shoes that could accompany her fur with her fur gloves with wooden fingers and fur bracelet in, in an ensemble. In her illustration for Project for First Sandals from 1936, she envisioned a black pump with a thin ankle strap and tuft of fur covering the top of the foot. The unnatural fur growing from the smooth surface of the porcelain pieces of the tea set and on the body of, and on the body, oops, sorry. The unnatural fur growing from the smooth surface of the porcelain pieces of the tea set an object and on the body provide the possibility that this fantasy of fur could become a reality at any given moment. The combination of the fur glove and the bracelet for Schiaparelli, if worn together, would cover the body in fur in a manner similar to object. The spoon, saucer, and teacup are replaced with the wrist, hand, and foot, breaking their conventional functions as they become active representations of repulsion and arousal. Once bedecked in fur accessories, the human body takes on the characteristics of the mass produced object that embodies projected fantasies, projected fetishistic desires rather, that are both real and imagined. Additionally, plaster white toes topped with red varnished nails emerge from the opening where the foot would settle. Oppenheim mimicked her own concept of the fabricated body parts that reside in place of their inanimate counterparts. The lifelike toes growing out of Oppenheim's shoes are reminiscent of those that emanate from a pair of boots in René Magritte's The Red Model from 1934. Magritte imagined a pair of time-worn leather boots with undone laces transitioning into human feet. The leather, made from dried out animal skin, develops into human skin. Oppenheim and Magritte's reimagining of everyday footwear explores the integral function of the way clothes are embedded into the presentation of the body. The boot turned toward the viewer is emblazoned with a vein that runs alongside of the foot and induces a sense of life into the shoe. The inclusion of the anatomical vein also resemble the veins uh, that flow across the top, top of the hands printed on Oppenheim's gloves. The imagery referencing the human anatomy in turn doubles its characteristics. Schiaparelli drew inspiration from the images presented in Magritte's paintings for her designs as well. In her 1938 haute couture collection, the same collection that included skeleton dress, she presented a pair of black suede women's boots trimmed with monkey fur around the ankles. The boots have a heel that measures a little over three inches, creating a slight elevation to the 
for the fur to cascade from the ankle to slightly brush the floor. As Don Aids notes, there is a clear resemblance between Schiaparelli's boots and shoes illustrated in Magritte's La Mort de Saint May, Love Disarmed of 1935. In this painting, a pair, a pair of black shoes with wavy light brown hair overflow from the depths of the insole to rest on the pale, pale yellow ground. Behind the shoes, a round mirror hangs on a light gray wall while reflecting a fragment of hair. The tuft of hair visible in the mirror could be, a, a, could be the reflection of the hair growing out of the shoes. However, it may belong to an unknown figure at the edge of, edge of the frame. The only certainty provided by either, by either pair of footwear is the simulation of arousal and discover, discomfort produced by the unavoidable fetish. Mara Oppenheim and Elsa Schiaparelli were forerunners in creating avant-garde designs that showcase the body as a surrealist vision. As Oppenheim stated in her 1974 acceptance speech in Basel, freedom is not given to you, you have to seize it. They reclaimed the body as a base for their an analysis of the ideas and imagery that circulated throughout the surrealist movement. The malleable nature of clothing allowed them to mask the body with the imaginings of the unconscious, surfacing the fears that lie deep within the unconscious. Oppenheim and Schiaparelli unveiled the perception of convulsive beauty by embracing the imagery provided by Freud's explanation of both the fetish and the uncanny. They successfully meld the masculine vision with their feminine aesthetics and their revolutionary fashion designs. Thank you all for joining me this evening. That concludes my presentation. If you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to contact me via email. My email is V-A-C-C-A-R-O. L-A-U-R-E-N-M as in Mary at gmail.com and I hope you have a